don't spill anything. I'm sorry? Just don't spill anything. Yeah, don't spill anything. I didn't finish the uh, the homework. Why'd you show up today then? Uh, I'm kidding. Good question. No, I had a uh, I had a really busy week. I just didn't get to it. I forgot about it. Now I tried to do it just now, and it was just like bad. Um, do you think I could email to you? Or? Yeah, that'd be fine. Got it. Um. Yeah, as soon as possible. Uh, yeah. I started it, but uh, yeah, I need to finish it. Are you starting the uh, Kepler stuff? <laughs> no. Kepler? I did his, uh, I did that midterm though. Last night I was like, it took so long. How long was yours? I think it ended up being like six pages. Did you quote a lot? No, I didn't quote anything because I thought he didn't, he didn't want that. He said he didn't want like research. I think it's the same thing for this paper. He doesn't really want research. He wants like your thoughts. doesn't count. Does it? I thought it did. It does not. And no one ever goes to those orientations, right? I don't know. I thought it counted. No. I, I graduated from the honor program, and it definitely does not count. Uh, it's like Stat 101, but the honors one. Yeah, it's yeah. I know, it's stress. I'd like to come know what honors copies. Yeah, Are you all honors students? Yeah, I think. No. What? You're not? Are you? Honors kid? No. Oh. Um, is Luke showing up today? He's right yeah, there. he's coming. Oh, he is. Um, all right. Does anyone have the homework that they want to give me? Or yep. maybe they don't want to give it to me, I don't know. I mean, if you haven't need it. I was asking uh, if we... I did not do number 10. Do you want me to do it before? Um, you can give me what you have and just email it to me. Can we maybe go over the Wait, like the last part of the third question? Because that was, that was the only part I was a bit confused uh, about. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of problems on that one, so we will definitely go over that. <laughs> um, Yeah, I'm just messing with 
Definitely worth the experience. Yeah. Great time. I want to go back. But most of us to drink in all the different bars again. Um, Oxford's so nice. What class did you take? Uh, European globalization post World War II or something. Yeah, it was an econ one. But I'm also the one, same person that convinced or told me all that it should definitely not count as an econ class. Because it's really a history class, but it's also the same as the globalization class that Mihal teaches, which, did any of you take? It's a good class. Uh, it was an honors class, actually, that she taught. It was really good. Um, okay, so I know I said we would go over the last question, uh, 3, 3C, uh, but I just also want to go over these models again quickly, because I kind of rushed through them last week, because I could tell I was losing you guys. Um, and I know this week's not going to be any easier because you have, this is your last class before spring break. Um, but it doesn't hurt to hear it again. So, whenever we talk about the mo these models, these large open economies, we have to have these three graphs involved. We have the market for loanable funds. We have net capital outflows. And then we're also going to have the, uh, foreign, the market for foreign exchange. So that's basically the exchange rate. FX is foreign exchange rate. Uh, sometimes it's called 4X. I don't know. Forex trading. I don't know if you guys have heard that. So essentially, we always need to start with these three models where we'll have savings, and then we have investment plus capital flows. From here, we bring this equilibrium point over. to our net capital flows um, model, essentially. And that will tell us our uh, net capital flows. Net capital flows. And then this side was rate. Here we also have rate. And here we have laudable funds. So, Net capital flows, net exports, they'll equal each other. And over here we'll have real um, exchange rates. So I'll just put real FX. So we bring capital flows down, and we're going to graph that along with our net, um, our real exchange, or our net exports as a function of our exchange rate. And this is always the model we kind of want to start with before we start doing our analysis. So here, when we look at the first one, fiscal policies at home, we're going to consider an expansionary government. So this is an increase in spending or it's a decrease in taxes. Um, whenever we have this scenario, we're going to see a decrease in savings. So savings will shift to the left. This reduces the amount of loanable funds there are in the market. Our investment um, and capital flows model hasn't changed here, only our savings. So we now have a new interest rate, so we go from R1 up to R2. We'll then bring this new rate over to our net capital flows model. So we have our capital flows shift to the left, so we reduce capital flows, and then we bring that down into our market for foreign exchange. So 
by reducing savings in our market, we're going to see the exchange rate, the real exchange rate goes up. I see some of you are writing. I'll give you a minute. Um, and then, like, think about it. Ask, you know, if you have any questions, ask. It's not that there's less money in the system. No, people are saving it. They're not saving it. Um, but they're not loaning it out. And because they're not loaning it, your rate goes up. And when your rate goes up, people want to kind of send their goods to you. So you have capital inflows. Wait, these are negative. Capital outflows. Oh, wait, no, no, this is not a model where we're talking about negative or positive. But we just move along this model. The model that we have to talk about positives, negatives, that's when we start looking at um, 3C. But we move along here, so we're, this is a movement, not a shift. Remember that language from macro. So we move along our model to the, wherever this new interest rate is, or real rate, real interest rate. And from there, we'll find our exchange. Um, all of these, um, scenarios are independent of the previous scenario. So now, to do this analysis again on the board, we would have to get rid of all of this and start over. Because now, we have this original scenario. All our original scenario is in blue, right? So we had investment and savings, we had our real interest rate. But now, we see there's an uh, increase in demand for investment. Um, so the scenario is an increase in investment leads to an increase in the real interest rate. Um, this makes sense if we think about it. We, people want to invest more money, it doesn't necessarily mean people are saving more money, but if you want to make more investments, you'll pay a higher amount um, to have that money. So the investment um, plus capital flows line shifts to the right. We see an increase, so it shifts to the right. We now have a new real interest rate. When we bring that real interest rate over to our net capital outflows model, we see capital flows, outflows has moved to the left along this line, and from here we can again again, bring that down into the market for an exchange. And we'll see again that our exchange rate, our real exchange rate has gone up. Um, remember a couple weeks ago I said the hardest part about econ is forgetting the previous scenario that we just talked about to talk about a new scenario. Um, I just tutored someone from Micro. They could not get that concept in their mind, that they had to forget what we just talked about to start over. And you're not forgetting everything. You're just forgetting the previous scenario. We're no longer talking about, you know, the shift in savings. Now we're just talking about an increase in demand for investment. Uh, and then this one was particularly um, relevant last year is when um, our president had just started talking about um, high import tariffs on Chinese steel manufacturing, so I thought this was a good scenario for us to talk about. So, um, the first thing that occurs here, notice, nothing's happening in loanable funds, nothing's happening in net capital outflows. I can't read off of this thing, I don't know why I keep walking over there. Um, but the first thing that occurs here is we have um, protectionist policies, and that raises the demand for exports, because we're not importing anymore. We have to produce more to export. Um, from there, we see an increase in the exchange rate, but also net exports will go unchanged, because nothing outside of this model has changed. Net exports stays the same but we do see a change in our exchange rate. 
and when our exchange rate goes up, people don't want to buy as much from us because it's now more expensive in real terms. All right. Um, and then we'll just, you know, we won't go over this model. I think three we've gone over is good so far. Uh, but now we can look at question 3C. Um, so the fiscal policy makers of Leverett want to adjust taxes to maintain the exchange rate at its previous level. What should they do? Um, if they do this, what are the overall effects on saving, investment, net exports, and the interest rate? All right, so one of the first things we have to look at is this model. I'm gonna get rid of this. So do you guys remember net exports equals savings minus investment? All right, so if we look here, we'll have a savings minus investment line, and we'll have net exports as a function of our exchange rate. So what happened in our previous scenario? So. Um, the exports of Leverett are now unpopular, right? Um, so the net exports line will shift down. People don't want them anymore. So that was our exchange rate one. This is our exchange rate two. But savings minus investment still equals net exports. This is the important part. This is where we were at equilibrium with exchange rate one. Our new equilibrium is at exchange rate two. Where net exports has not changed, just the price of the goods have become cheaper. So we still send out the same amount, but we get back in return less essentially, or not we, but leverage. So these fiscal policy makers Want it so that the exchange rate doesn't change. So we need to somehow shift savings minus investment to the left so that it is here. So we need to now shift that whole line here so we can go back to exchange rate one. Does everyone follow so far? If we look back at those scenarios that we just talked about, and we go back to the expansionary government, the only way we were able to get this exchange rate to go up is when we shifted savings to the left. So we decreased savings in the economy. To do this, they can either A, cut taxes, or they can increase um, government spending. What? It's increase in spending or decrease in taxes. That's how we saw a savings shift to the left. Does that make more sense now? Yes. Especially pertaining to that question in particular. Yeah, so this is where, what you, I know this isn't one of the models that we particularly went over. We went over the three graphs all together. But when you go back to this model, which we probably talked about early on. Where is it? Maybe we didn't talk about it? Ah, no. Kind of. Yeah. I thought we talked about it. But you look at this model and think about that scenario where we either have to increase government spending or cut taxes, it makes sense. Because really what we have to do is we have to decrease savings in the economy. Yes? Um, so the question here is what should they do? Should they increase savings or cut, ta uh, 
It doesn't really matter what you choose, as long as you can back it up. So if you say they should increase government spending, um, what will that do to the overall savings rate? Yeah, it'll reduce the savings. Um, does investment change though? No, investment just doesn't change. We haven't done anything with investment. Um, net exports, will they go up, go down, what'll happen? savings minus investments. Right, but net exports equals savings minus investments. So if we reduce savings minus investment, we also have to reduce net exports. Yeah. Um, and reduce doesn't mean get it to zero. It doesn't mean reduce the trade balance. It just means reduce. So shift to the left. So you can become more negative, essentially. Um, Did you say we're reducing? Exports? But that's yeah, isn't that? But that's only just the a function. If you're at NX at the at the first graph, because I mean you just you already shifted it to the left. No, no, no. The first thing that happened was we went from NX one to NX two. Yeah. We shifted the whole net exports graph yeah. down. Now we have to stay on this new um, line. That's what I'm going to call it. That's yeah. what I'm choosing. Um, but we reduced savings minus investment. Yeah. What was your question? Does it make sense then? Kind of? Kind of. I'm confused. But I mean, I'm not. That makes sense, but I don't really know what my question But it's like was. the x axis is in terms of net exports. Because that's why I was confused. But like. So this is, the graph is net exports in terms of, as a function of um, the real exchange rate, but the bottom x-axis is the net exports. So it's not the net exports in, the fun in terms of the real exchange rate that's changed, it's just the net exports. And SNI is only in ex like terms of net yeah, exports. Yeah, what she said. That actually makes sense. Yeah, because I didn't get it until that clicked. Yeah. So are we good now on this? I had the exact same uh, question. Yeah. yeah. Can you explain it one more time? So like, um... Do you want to come up to the board? You can come up to the board. Do, that's a really awkward now. But basically, so like, what I got confused by is like, this is net exports and this is. But this isn't what we're talking about when we say net exports. Because this is net exports in terms of the exchange, rate. the exchange rate. Whereas this graph, the x-axis is in terms, like if you were drawing, like if you're in school and you're drawing a bar chart, mm -hmm. you'd write this is. So, because we don't have numbers on it, but these numbers are the net exports. And so SNI, the formula is net exports equals SNI. So net exports is reduced because like it SNI, SNI is moving down. down. S minus I is moving down along net exports. Okay. But this isn't. This is kind of like I don't really know what that is. So what? Isn't that kind of the nominal the nominal um yeah. could you say it's like uh, a function. This is the, the one is nominal and one is real? Yeah. No, 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 no. This I wouldn't call this nominal at all. But isn't the whole thing that you're trying to reinstate the old um, exchange rate? The real exchange rate. Because whenever we talk about this, E1, E2, that's all the real exchange rate. Yeah, yeah. This but is just what are our exports with that real exchange rate. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I meant. So like, if we have exchange rate one, regardless of savings and investment, this will be our model. Yeah. If we have exchange rate two, regardless of savings and investment, this will be the model that we look at. Then wherever savings and investment falls, that's where we get our net exports. Yeah. With that real exchange rate. But wouldn't it be a true statement if you say that I mean net exports reduced, but in terms of US dollars it didn't because the exchange rate changed? You, when we talk about US dollars though, we're not talking about real value, we're talking about nominal. Because the dollar puts a price tag on something. We're talking about six cars versus seven cars. You know, we're talking about real item. Yeah. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we're good on this, I'll take more questions. Like, we don't have to rush through it. But if we're good on this, um, we're going to start chapter seven, which is on. Yeah. Can you just go through? So say we, the, uh, 
then you choose to reduce taxes. Yeah. So if we reduce taxes, mm -hmm. we'll still see savings and investment shift to the left. Yeah, yeah. If we increase government spending, savings and investment will still shift to the left. But if you reduce taxes, now you have to get into this whole other scenario. This is where economics starts getting really like fussy. Like, all right, we reduce taxes, but we don't know anything about what happened to government spending. So government spending, if we assume it stayed the same, now we have to run on a deficit. If they're running on a deficit, then you have to start talking about the crowding out effect. I don't want you guys to get that far into the analysis for this question. Um, but that is another thing you have to start considering. If you cut taxes, what happens with crowding out? Because now the government has to go and borrow money. If the government's borrowing money, the real inter the interest rate will go, oh wait, actually we do have to talk about the interest rate. So if the government's now borrowing money, now the interest rate's gonna go up. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and then the other part of it was, uh, if you increase government spending, right? Again, the government, to increase government, we haven't talked anything about cutting taxes. So we're back to that scenario where the taxes are whatever the taxes are. Now the government goes and decides to increase spending. How are they going to finance that spending? Taxes. No, they have to go and borrow. Well, they can't use capital. They go into the market for loanable funds, and once they go into the market for loanable funds, the real, in the, I keep saying real, but the interest rate will go up. Because the government has to borrow money. Um, either way, this is what we'd have to do, essentially. We have to cut that savings, and the only way to do that is cut taxes or increase government spending. Um, yeah, C was a... I didn't realize how particularly tricky C was until uh, they caught me in the tutoring lab. Yeah. And like I couldn't figure out where the missing link was. And it was essentially right here. It was understanding that our net exports isn't changing unless our savings and investment changes. Mm -hmm. Is that a little sample? I can't remember what we're talking about ten years ago. Uh, I don't know either. Honestly, um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Sample for ten years ago. Uh, there should be so you said expansionary. No, that taxes. was that was definitely what we were talking about. We said reducing taxes, but yeah, um, tax revenue. Reduced. I mean, yeah, yeah. said nothing about like government spending. No, we just said we just talked about uh, yeah how that affects consumption because I mean that's what it says in the formula and then how that decreases spending. So I guess that's kind of what we talked about. You mean decreases saving? Savings. Yeah, I mean savings, not spending. Um, all right, and uh, you know, I'll go through all of these, you know, whatever you guys handed in. I know some of you said you didn't finish everything or whatever, it's fine. Um, we could definitely talk more about these when we get back from break, um, especially if I find something particularly not right um, about all of them. Um, but I don't expect that to happen. You guys all seem, you know, pretty on point, which is good. Um, and you all hand everything in, which is nice. I got a lot of pushback last year from, particularly Nikki, Nikki yeah. <laughs> who uh, didn't want to do anything, but did it eventually. Um, all right, so now we're gonna talk about unemployment and the labor market. Um, every Thursday I like to reread the chapter, just to make sure I, you know, I go in with a fresh mind. And as I read through this chapter, I thought, they should know most of this, but there's going to be one particular part that's very um, kind of annoying, and it's the chart. Once we get to the chart, you'll get why it's kind of annoying. Um, but so for the purposes of this chapter, we have all of these different letters that we have to worry about. L is going to be labor force. When you think about labor force, uh, what does that mean to you guys? It's the people that can work. And they don't have to have jobs. Okay. Uh, but they also have to be looking for work if they're not working. 
Like I can't just, like, if I'm sitting at home, I am physically able of work. But if I'm not looking for a job, I'm not going to count the labor force because it means I don't want to work. Um, so L is going to be all the people that are unemployed and the number of people who are employed, which kind of makes sense if we look at this equation eventually. But so E is the number of people, uh, number of employed workers, and U is going to be the number of uh, people who are unemployed. So our labor force is all the people that are unemployed plus all the people that are employed. Therefore, our unemployment rate is going to be the number of people unemployed divided by the labor force, all the people that can work. Um, again, we have to simplify these models. We can't start thinking about all this, you know, weird like population growth and like people aging out of the workforce and all that stuff. So we're just going to assume our labor force is fixed, um, and U and E are what change. So unemployment and employment are what change. Um, S, the letter S is just going to denote um, the rate of job separation, and F will denote the rate of job finding for the unemployed. So, in this model, the rate of people finding work is equal to the rate of people leaving work, leaving jobs. What does work separation? Not like getting laid off or whatever. Um, and we even have this nice little proof of a steady state. So our rate of, un of people losing work and equals our rate of people finding work. So this um, the rate of unemployment equals. Um, the rate of those in the labor force minus the unemployed losing work, essentially. So from there, we go down to this next step. So we can divide everything by L. This was the confusing thing that we did like three chapters ago where we divide everything by L, and now all of a sudden we have this number in the equation. So the rate of people losing work, not losing work, getting work, is equal to the rate of people losing work times one minus the unemployment rate. Because U over L is the unemployment rate. Can we do that again? Yes. Thank you. All right. So F times U, that is the rate of job, of getting a job times the unemployment rate. And we're saying it equals um, the rate of losing a job times the labor force minus the unemployment rate. So F times U unemployment equals S. So S again is that rate of losing jobs and times L minus U. This is people number of people employed. So this is all the people in the labor force minus the people who aren't working. So this is E, essentially. So you could basically say people, the unemployed get hired at the same rate that the employed people get laid off. Exactly. That's exactly what this is saying. Thank you. Is that um, true though? Huh? Is it true? No, 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 just for this. Oh, just okay. for this model. Yeah. Sorry, what was your name? The rate of people finding jobs is the same, is the same rate as people losing jobs. Um, so this whole time through, we're going to, the next step is essentially just saying this rate, whatever this rate is, is unemployment equal to the rate of one minus unemployment. So one minus unemployment. And now we're going to do some fancy stuff with this S and F. So. We got the unemployment rate equals S divided by S plus F. I know, very annoying. Um, which can also be written as the unemployment rate equals 1 divided by the quantity 1 plus the rate of people finding jobs divided by the rate of people losing jobs.
So in this scenario, essentially, if um, we suppose the rate of employed people losing their jobs is 1%, and the rate that the unemployed people find jobs is 20%. Um, did I just make up that scenario? No. Um, so I have the scenario here. Can you say that again? Yeah, so if we look at this last little part here, this is the scenario we're going to work with. The rate of people um, losing their jobs is going to be 1%, and the rate of people finding jobs, the unemployed finding jobs, is 20%. So it's not equal anymore. The quantities are equal. So if you look, um, F the is rate the rate, rate, S is a rate, but the rate of finding jobs times... Uh, S, S is not a rate, S is... Yeah, yeah it's the rate of... Oh, yeah, it's the rate. yeah, they're rates. The quantities themselves are the same. Did I say that they were the same, the rates were the same before? It's not the rates, it's the amount. So the people, number of people losing their jobs is the same as the number of people finding jobs. So basically the people are in quantity 20 times more than the unemployed. Wait, say that again? In this scenario, the employed people would be 20 times more than the unemployed, so that yeah. it equals. 20 times the rate is Huh? Oh, sorry, the rate is... The, the, the rate of unemployed people finding jobs is 20%. The rate of people losing jobs is 1%. So the rate of... So the amount of the employed population is 20 times the amount of the unemployed population. So, what we can do is we can start substituting these numbers in, essentially. So, so if S equals 0 0.01, that was the rate of losing a job, right? And F equals 0.2, the rate of finding a job. So, we start plugging everything in, u over l equals, we're gonna use this one, because it's just easier to read, um, s over s plus f equals 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.01 plus 0.2. So 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.21 equals what? Somebody tell me. I have the answer. I don't need you to tell me, but I want to make sure you guys can use a calculator. 51.1 over 20.1. What? Yeah, what's that number? which essentially means the unemployment rate in this economy is about 5%. Which makes sense if you go and look at these numbers, and if you have a good number sense, essentially. Um, because when we break 100 down into 20 parts, we get 5%. So if we know that one of these is 20 times more than the other one, then we know we have about 20 groups, 20 equal groups. Really, there's 21 equal groups. Now I might just be talking nonsense, but essentially what I'm saying is if you look at these numbers, you should have had an idea that there was gonna be about a 5% unemployment rate. By using this equation, um, you can find out exactly what the unemployment rate would be. Good. Um, so really, um, another way that we can kind of think about this is if S equals 0 0.01, we can say that the average employment lasts eight months, the average unemployment lasts five months. One over 0 0.01 equals 100. Each of these is gonna be a month. And then here, one over 0 0.02, 0.2 equals 5, and again, we're going to say that's month. That wasn't in the notes, I'm just telling you that. That's wait, 5 months is unemployment or unemployment? Unemployment. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I meant 
this is just the last little thing about policy. So any policy aimed at reducing unemployment um, either must increase the rate of finding a job or reduce the rate at which the employees lose their job. All right, uh, job search and frictional unemployment. So in our original model, the one we were just talking about, uh, we're assuming that um, all sets of skills are the same for each laborer. So if you know how to be a carpenter, everyone else in the economy knows how to be a carpenter. Um, so the flow of information about job availabilities is imperfect though. We know this to be true. Um, and then frictional unemployment is the unemployment caused by the time it takes for workers to find a job. So you guys will graduate next May, right? Mostly. Are you on, what year are you guys? Sophomore, juniors. All right, so next May or the May after that, um, and it, hopefully, bless you, hopefully all of you have jobs before you graduate. You have offers in hand. That would be a very nice thing. But so let's say you graduate May 14th. Sounds about right. And you start work May 16th. You weren't really frictionally unemployed. But let's say you graduate May 14th, and it takes you four months to find employment. For four months, you were frictionally unemployed. It took you four months to find a job. You can't collect unemployment, that's a different story, but you're still counted as unemployed. Does that make sense? All right, so causes of frictional unemployment. Um, as demand for goods shift, so does the demand for employment. So we have all of these different examples here. Um, so with the invention of computers, there was less of a demand for a typewriter manufacturer. So all those people that were typewriter manufacturers kind of got laid off. They had to find new jobs because we no longer needed typewriter manufacturers. Maybe a lot of them went and became computer manufacturers. I don't know. But they had to find some other job because people didn't want their product anymore. Um, a rise in the price of gasoline will increase oil production jobs in Texas but it will reduce work in states like Michigan, which produce cars. Again, because people, they want to increase the production of oil because as price goes up, people want to produce more of it. That's basic supply and demand. Um, but now because oil is more expensive, um, people don't want to buy cars as much because maybe now they'll opt for public transportation because it's cheaper to take a bus to work every day than it is to put gas in your car. Yeah. Um, and then we have sectoral shifts, so changes in the composition of demand among industries or regions. Individuals also become unemployed if their firm fails or their performance is bad. Um, if you're a bad employee, we're gonna get rid of you. Um, or, you know, maybe you're Enron and Enron goes out of business and 100,000 people lose their job. Um, that's essentially what we're talking about here. Um, so we have public policy and frictional unemployment. So in the United States, uh, you can get up to 26 weeks of unemployment. Um, and it's about 50% of what you were earning. When you go to a different country, if you go to uh, you know, France, wherever, they might have much longer unemployment um, benefits. What they find is that the longer the unemployment benefits, the longer people stay unemployed. Because what's the incentive for them to go and find a job if they're getting money regardless? Um, that's what C says. By receiving these payments, um, the unemployed are less pressed to find another job and are more likely to turn down a bad job offer. So this could also be a good thing though, right? Because if you're sitting at home and you know, you were just laid off, let's say you're making $100,000 a year, and in two months you got a job offer for $75,000. If you don't have any unemployment benefits, you're gonna take that money. You're gonna reduce your wages to make at least something. Whereas, if you already have money coming in, you might wait it out another couple of months to get a better offer. Um, so, even though these unemployment benefits increase unemployment to an extent, it doesn't mean it's a bad program. Um, 
So one way they could think about kind of changing the, the system is um, if unemployment insurance is that the previous employer needs to pay the unemployment of the unemployed, this will cause firms less likely, this will give an incentive for firms not to lay someone off. If they have to pay to lay someone off for the next 26 weeks, why are they gonna lay someone off when they could just have them work instead? Does that make sense? Um, and then, so essentially by increasing the cost of laying someone off, firms aren't gonna lay someone off anymore. Um, as it is now, um, firms only pay a percentage of unemployment, but everyone who has a job pays into unemployment. Um, it's just kind of taken out of your paycheck. You don't have to use. Um, we talked about this, so we'll, we'll skip over the case study. Um, real, real wage rigidity and uh, structural unemployment. So wage rigidity, it's the idea that wages are not going to go down. So it's the failure of wages to adjust to a level at which labor supply equals labor demand. So let me get rid of this. Quantity, price, market for labor. So we have supply. In this market, who is supplying? Firms or individuals? Firms or households? Households. Yeah, the households is the supply. Households supply. They're the ones that, oh, P. That's going to be wages. Um, Q is number of people. But so as wages go up, more people are going to want to go and work because they can make more money. And then, you know, demand. So that's firms. As prices go down, firms will want to hire more people because their marginal product of labor will go up. Um, so if we find that wages... You have wage star there. And now all of a sudden, firms don't need people anymore. They hire robots. They buy robots. Demand shifts to the left, P prime. This would be the new wage, wage prime. But because wages are stuck here, we now see unemployment. And instead of having Q prime people employed, we keep this higher wage and we have Q double prime people employed. So employment actually reduces even farther because of wage rigidity. Did I ask you how many of you are in managerial or took managerial? Yes. Yeah. You're both in it now, or no, I, you took it? Took it. Took it. Oh, I had it. But I said yes, you asked me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so do you remember the analysis on monopolies? Yes. It's essentially the same analysis. Um, where uh, wages stay higher, reducing the amount of things that are produced. It reduces the amount of people actually being in. Um, Would la labor be fixed in that, the quantity of labor be fixed in that mode? Um, quantity of labor is not fixed here. What is, um, this idea is as wages go up, more people will want to work. That's essentially all I'm saying. Um, we're not talking, the labor, you're right, we did talk about a fixed labor market. Um, I remember in the models I was seeing, it's like, it's usually, to the right, like from what I have worked out. Well, if we start this analysis over that way, I see what you're saying and it makes sense because I forgot in this model that we're talking about we have fixed labor. Yeah. Uh, fixed labor, demand, uh, wages, quantity, 
labor, uh, firms, whatever, supply demand. So we have wage star. Now we see a shift in demand. Wages stay the same. So now this, that's not what I wanted it to be, but whatever. This is now unemployment. Where if wages would adjust, that's where wages would move down to. But no one's, that doesn't happen in the market. We don't see real wages drop to keep everyone employed. We just see the number of people employed reduce and wages stay the same. Make sense? Um, so when wages fail to reduce, jobs are rationed and the supply exceeds those willing to work at a lower weight, wage, uh, which leads to um, unemployment, just showed unemployment. Um, structural unemployment, that is results from wage rigidity and job rationing. And then firms fail to reduce wages um, and, reduce the rate, and reduce the rate of unemployment. That sentence doesn't make sense. This should say increase the rate of unemployment, not in reduce, increase. All right. Minimum wage laws. Um, so the government limits the amount that a wage can be reduced. So it's typically 30 to 50 percent of the manufacturing rate. So if you remember back to day one, I said the manufacturing rate in the United States, I think I said it was 2215. Um, but it's like the second slide of chapter one. So unemployment is typically not, un not unemployment. Minimum wage is typically going to be 30 to 50 percent of whatever the average manufacturing wage is. Um, for most people, this wage is non-binding. Most people do not fit unemployment, uh, do not fit into the minimum wage category. Um, so minimum, the minimum wage in some fields raises the wage above the equilibrium price and reduces the amount of labor that will be hired by a firm, not by a firm. Uh, what we find is that uh, it's mostly um, teen labor that is affected here. So a 10% increase in the minimum wage will lead to a 1% to 3% increase in unemployment. Yeah? Are part-time laborers included in the wage course? Um, you're going to see in like three slides. Okay. That is a very tricky question. They are included, okay. but they're also part of a different part of unemployment than, because they're not unemployed, they have jobs, mm -hmm. but you'll see it in like three slides. Um, so current minimum wage will put a family below the poverty line. Um, just let that sink in. The least amount of money you can earn in the United States still makes you really poor. Um, so earned income tax credits is a way that a family would receive payments from the government instead of um, a higher minimum wage. So, I'm not going to get into that philosophical argument. I, but I really don't like tax wise. Essentially, what this would be saying is how much would they get on a tax credit? Like, how much would a poor family get? In this scenario? Yeah. I don't know because we don't have it. Um, I mean, they're now, now they're really discussing this idea of a universal income, right? Have you guys been tracking that at all? Yeah, there's a guy running for president. Where, is she from Switzerland? Sweden. Oh, never mind. Switzerland voted on it, like, two years ago. They said no, overwhelmingly. But it, they actually got to vote on it, which is big news. There's a guy running for president who's running on the idea of... In the United States? Yeah, Andrew Yang. It's called a freedom dividend. It's, it's, it's an extra thousand dollars a month to every American over the age of 18. It's well, between the 18, ages of 18 and 65. Interesting. Interesting. Full case notes, you're doing nothing. Um, that's, I would not argue that that's a bad idea. The economics behind it, what he says, sound, I mean, 
Um, I have done some looking into that. Um, it's, I, I, I do think it's not a bad idea. Um, oh. Mostly because nowadays, um, again, if you work for minimum wage, you're gonna be below the poverty line. With that extra $12,000, you really wouldn't be below the poverty line. But a lot of people take work because they have to work, yeah. which is good. Like we, People want to work, they want to be productive, but people would get involved in different work if it wasn't about the money. There are a lot of people, especially if you look at places like Texas, Arizona, Arkansas, that would love to be teachers. If you're a teacher in states like that, you earn like $35,000 a year with a master's degree. By comparison, the average teacher in Rockland County makes like $113,000 a year. Granted, it's a lot more expensive to live here, but how many people do you think in states like that aren't going into a profession like teaching because they can't make enough money to live? West Virginia, I'm only using teachers as examples because I just got a math, uh, my teaching degree, um, but like in West Virginia, teachers have to work like four jobs. If there was that, maybe they would. Yeah, is that growing on the basis of one? Like the big one is trucking, because when automated trucks come in and they will, mm -hmm. you're going to have this huge displacement of, of workers. Who yeah. and the 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 ways that a, the plan to fund it is going to be a tax on automation. So Amazon, mm, all these big corporations, they're going to pay an automation tax that will go through the government to this. What he calls a freedom dividend. I think it's more of like a cash phrase. Yeah, it is like it's always a cash phrase. But wouldn't that like big time mess up inflation and stuff and like housing prices and everything if everyone just has one thousand dollars a month? I'll address that in a second. If you give that to the top one percent, it's going to like net. It's just going to become nothing because then everyone has the same amount of money going in. So it's a kind of equal. What? If like what if it's equal then? If you're giving like you're not just giving like a lower class the money, you're giving everyone the money. Yeah. yeah. So then they're just making more money off that, and you're still ma you're still making not enough, so they're uh, still above you. In that respect, does this kind of zero itself out? Um, no, because people in the top one percent one percent earn like uh, spend like three percent of their income. Yeah. That twelve thousand dollars doesn't make a difference. People in the bottom twenty percent spend one hundred percent of their income because they have to in order to survive. So they're now not spending 100% of their income in order to survive. They're now $12,000 better off. To answer your question, we're not just printing, we wouldn't just be printing the money, I'm assuming, it's not my plan, it's this guy's. No, it's like reallocation. And yeah, it's just like, tax. so right now, if we think about the way the system is set up, this is like way offline, but I think you guys are way more interested in this than this, so I'll run with this for a minute. Um, if you think about how, how it is now, we have a percentage of earnings to capital, right? And percentage of earnings to labor. Do you remember that? Yeah. When did we talk about that? Was that chapter three? Chapter three or four. No, no, no. Chapter three or four. We have, um, there's marginal product of labor and marginal product of capital, essentially. Yeah. But so marginal product of capital, the rate goes up. Capital earns more and more. So holders of capital keep earning more money labor earns less money. So now if you take money out of the system by taxing corporations, essentially, yeah. you can now move that money back to labor. It's very difficult to force companies to pay employees a higher rate. And they're just gonna okay, I think, I, think I, I didn't really explain my idea. Right? So I'm not saying that there's inflation because the money is gonna be printed. I'm saying my point is that isn't there like for example, for housing, isn't there a lot more competition then, and the demand would the demand would be drastically higher because now everyone can afford some sort of living. And yeah, because there's a higher cost of living because everyone has more money, so everything's going to cost more. Yeah, but one that's of the yeah. really effect in the first like couple of months is at some point a bunch of realize okay, we're losing money because of the tax. We're going to set higher prices now and get a cup of coffee instead of like four dollars. We're going to charge like six dollars, ten dollars. Uh, I think you're assuming it's a much higher adjustment in prices than I think it would actually be. Because um, think of how much does Apple earn a year? What is it like a hundred billion dollars or something crazy? Mm. All right, now imagine they earn that hundred billion dollars and you just take ten billion dollars away. Like Apple is still making a ton of money. 
I don't know if they would really have to change their prices yeah, all that the much. CSRA, at least has a reason to check their prices. You can argue it. I mean, you can play devil's advocate with all of it. I think the main argument here is that there's an issue with so many people living in the United States below the poverty level. Just to clarify, what is the universal wage for society? That's the same idea. It's like everyone would get $12,000 a year. Okay. I think in Switzerland it was going to be $20,000 a year. Okay. Granted, it's a lot more expensive to live in the entirety of Switzerland than it is to live in the entirety of the United States. Um, I think even like if you want to become a citizen of Switzerland, you have to prove that you have enough money to buy property outright in cash and have an income of like $100,000. That's how it is in Monaco. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it makes sense. Like, like they won't allow you to become a citizen. You have to show like that you can afford it. Yeah. New Zealand's like that too. Yeah, New Zealand, it's like 10 million into the economy within two years. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's all the debt ceiling can barely get out of New Zealand. Yeah. Um, anyway, all right, what time is it? All right. slide nine. We can power through it. You can do it, guys. Um, unions and collective bargaining. So in the United States, um, only about 13% of employees have their wages set by collective bargaining. Um, this wage increases the wage above equilibrium level and reduces the number of people employed. Um, just kind of like a fact of unions. Um, Essentially what it is, is you have this collective bargaining power where you can now demand more money for the labor. Usually it's some sort of skilled labor that has this. Um, so like construction workers, pipe fitters, welders. You have to have a skill in order to accomplish this task. They're demanding a certain amount of money. Um, there's also professional unions. Um, teachers have a union. I think the professors here are in unions. Um, uh, teachers' assistants in universities can unionize in most states. Uh, and then we have insiders versus outsiders. So insiders try to keep wages high while outsiders try to reduce wages. Makes sense. Because wages are high, outsiders can't get in because they can't be employed. Unions also protect people from being laid off. Um, so you can't lay off a bunch of people and then hire a bunch of cheaper people. Like the union just doesn't go for that. Um, efficiency wage. So efficiency wages is the belief that um, a higher than equilibrium wage will cause workers to be more productive. So this could be done. Um, this could be the reason that uh, firms don't cut wages. If you keep wages high, people will continue to work and they'll work better. Um, High wages also reduce labor turnover. If you're making money, you have no reason to really leave and go make money somewhere else if you're making a good amount of money anyway. Um, the average quality of a firm's employees depends on the average wage of all its employees. So the higher wages uh, says you have a higher quality of employee. Um, so this last theory essentially is saying that high wages improve work rate. That the wage trend is the not increase their wages so much to force like the economic violence at. Yeah, I mean, it's not you, like you can't pay someone a million dollars and expect them to produce significantly more if you were paying them for a job that only requires them to get paid a hundred thousand um, dollars. Like that tenfold increase can't make you can only be a, a, a certain amount of productive essentially. Ah, the chart. The chart I was telling you about. We have all of these different unemployment rates. U3, unemployment three, is the official unemployment rate. So this is the person's unemployed 15 weeks or longer as a percentage of the civilian workforce, plus uh, job losers and the persons who completed temporary jobs as a percentage of the workforce. And then there's some other, like 6% in there. This is all just unemployment. This is people who are not working. Once we start looking at U4, U5, and U6, that's when it gets a little bit more confusing. 
So U4 is the total unemployed plus discouraged workers. So these are people that are no longer looking because they can't find jobs. Um, U5 is the total unemployed plus discouraged workers plus all other marginally attached workers. We're going to talk about marginally attached workers in like two seconds. Um, and then U6, this is all of that stuff I already said, plus the total employed um, part-time for economic reasons. So U6 is underemployment. U3 is unemployment. U6 is underemployment. So these numbers are from January 2018. If we click on this, which all of you have this link, it's in the PowerPoint. Um, we can see numbers for January 2019. They're not much different. Um, the economy's been pretty good for the last few years. Employment has increased. I think the number of jobs this year was, uh, this past quarter was like 305,000. Um, usually if we're at 250,000, we say the economy is growing. Is this the size of the lowest point in after World War II? Or during World War II? I believe I it. That's true. I don't know. Um, but I mean, if you look at um, underemployment, so if you look at U6, it hasn't changed that much. We're still at that 8.1%. Though I guess last year we were at 88 .8, So that is a considerable difference when we talk about the number of people. Um, all right. And then we have the labor market experience. Uh, yes. So from 1900, 1990, sorry, to 2006, 38% of unemployed people were unemployed for less than four weeks, while 31 were unemployed for more than 15 weeks. So they were basically unemployed for more than four months. Um, so 71% of time unemployed was spent by those unemployed for more than 15 weeks. So if we took all of the months unemployed by everyone that was unemployed, 71% of that time could be attributed to people who are unemployed for more than 15 weeks. Um, so if we suppose 10 people are unemployed for part of a given year, and of these people, eight are employed for 11 months, and two are employed for zero months, 75% um, of all unemployed time is taken up by two people. Because we have eight people time the one month that they were each unemployed equals eight months unemployment. Then we have two people that were unemployed for 12 months. So we got 24 months. So our total is we have 32 months of unemployment. 75% of this unemployment time is all attributed to these two people. So what we have to try to reduce is long-term unemployment. Because that's what drives up the numbers. That's what most of the unemployment can be attributed to. Um, then we have variation in unemployment uh, across various demographic groups. So, um, Economists find that when looking at the transition of individuals between employment and unemployment, that groups with high rates of unemployment often also have high rates of job separation. So if you come from a group that's already largely unemployed, you're more likely to lose your job. Um, we also get from this that there are higher rates of unemployment for black Americans than there are for white Americans. I don't know if this goes throughout the entire world. Um, there are definitely parts of the, country, of the world where it doesn't, but here, that is just a fact of the economy, an unfortunate fact of the economy. Uh, and then we have transitions into and out of the labor force. So about one third of the unemployed um, newly entered the labor force, and that will be you guys next year and the year after. Um, 
or it could also be those who are re-entering the labor force who had previously left it. So um, new mother goes out on maternity leave. She's out of work for six months. After six months, she goes to try to find a new job. She just re-entered the labor force. So she is now unemployed. For those six months that she wasn't working and wasn't looking for work, she wasn't unemployed. She was just out of the labor force. Um, we have discouraged workers. They're the people that have taken themselves out of the you know, labor force. They've decided, they've given up. There's no point in looking anymore. They can't find a job. Um, and then we already talked about the six um, figures. So we have U1 through U6. U6 is important to talk about. It's really like, because once you get to U6, it's the number of people who are, who have taken part-time jobs because they have to work, they have to make some sort of money, but they can't get full-time employment. It's better to make some money than no money, essentially. Um, and then we have the labor market in Europe, and that's gonna be it. All right, so we have the rise in European unemployment. So this is believed to be caused by generous unemployment benefits. We kind of talked about this before. The more unemployment benefits you have, the longer you are likely to stay out of the labor force. Um, there's also been a large decline in unskilled labor. This is due to automation and things like that. Um, many programs last for years, so people who shouldn't be included in unemployment are. So if you have unemployment benefits for three years, you're unemployed for three years while you collect that money. So in the United States, you would not be included as unemployed um, because you'd lose benefits after 26 weeks. Like It's a whole different system, but... It's just something to think about. Um, and then there's you know varying different unemployment rates across Europe, because Europe is not a single market, even though um, that was at one point the goal, right? Um, they've been kind of leaning away from that for the last couple of years. But um, overall, European unemployment is higher um, but it's not always this way, um, because of course, there's many different markets, there's, there's many different countries. Uh, Long-term unemployment shows uh, more variation among those countries, and spending on active labor markets reduces long-term unemployment. These are all just things that we have found in Europe. Um, we also have this nice little aspect of things. Um, Europeans work less hours than Americans. Um, they have shorter work weeks, enjoy more holidays. Um, so employment to population is higher in the United States. Um, in, people in the United States usually work a lot of hours when they do work. Um, economists believe that the underground economy is larger in Europe than it is in the United States because higher taxes so hours worked measured may be slightly off compared to the actual number. So it's possible that a lot of Europeans are just cheating the whole system by working off the books. Um, I don't know. Um, also in Europe, unions push for shorter work weeks and less hours. And the exchange that essentially happened is in Europe, they didn't take more money, they took more time off. In the United States, we said, no, we don't want time off, we want more money. Um, and then our conclusion. So unemployment represents wasted resources because we're not at full employment. And public policy can try to lower unemployment, essentially. But remember, what's the aim? What are we trying to reduce? Unemployment. What? Unemployment. Right, but what kind of unemployment? Yeah, long-term unemployment. All right, so we are now done. Um, have fun on spring break, or study hard, whatever you're supposed to do. Um, not study hard. Huh? Not study hard. Yeah, maybe just, you know, sleep. <laughs>